Welcome to the CIHR team in Children's Pain and CAFC webinar series on children's pain. The series on children's pain will be a three-part series looking at a variety of issues in children's pain, including current knowledge and attitudes towards pain, organizational culture as it relates to pain, management and assessment of pain in children, and much more. The CIHR team in children's pain and this webinar series are funded by a grant from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. The first episode, From Pokes to Post-Op, an overview of pain prevention and management in hospitalized children, presented by Drs. Bonnie Stevens and Fiona Campbell, can be found on the CAFC website at cafc.org slash podcasts, or on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network at www.ken.cafc.org in the category titled Children's Pain. Today we are presenting Episode 2, Reducing Pain in Infants and Young Children During Pokes and Other Procedures. This episode will be presented by Drs. Denise Harrison, Christine, Dr. Christine Chambers, and Janet Yamada. I'm Doug Maynard, Associate Director at CAFC, and welcome to Episode 2 of this webinar series on children's pain, Reducing Pain in Infants and Young Children During Pokes and Other Procedures. Dr. Denise Harrison is a postdoctoral fellow in the CIHR team in children's pain at the Hospital for Sick Children and the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing at the University of Toronto. She is also Associate Editor of, Neo, Neo, of the Neonatal Pediatric and Child Health Nursing Journal and the Column Editor for Implementation Matters for the International Association of the Study of Pain, Special Interest Group Newsletter. Her research interests include the effectiveness of sweet solutions for pain in di diverse populations of infants and utilization of pain assessment tools and effective pain management strategies for hospitalized infants. Dr. Harrison is the Principal Investigator of a Nurses Board of Victoria grant be Sweet to Babies During Immunization, and a co-investigator on the CIHR Knowledge Synthesis Grant, Systematic Review of Sweet Solutions for Acute Pain Relief in Infants. Dr. Christine Chambers is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Psychology and is the Canada Research Chair in Pain and Child Health at Dalhousie University and the IWK Health Centre in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Dr. Chambers' grant-funded research examines developmental and social influences on children's pain including family influences in pediatric chronic pain and disability, pain measurement in children, and sleep disturbances among adolescents with chronic pain. She is the recipient of a number of early career awards from organizations such as the Canadian Pain Society and the Canadian Psychological Association. Janet Yamada is a student at the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing at the University of Toronto and a nursing research associate at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Her PhD thesis focuses on a process evaluation of the EPIC intervention to improve neonatal pain practices. I'll now hand over to Dr. Harrison to start the presentation. Dr. Harrison? Okay, thank you, Doug. And welcome, everybody, to our second in our webinar series on pain in children. These webinars are supported by the CRHR team in children's pain, the CRHR Synthesis Grant, Knowledge Translation, and CAPC. As I said, this is our second webinar. On this slide, I have our series of three webinars for 2010. The first one we ran on Monday, March the 1st. This was from Pokes to Post-Op, an overview of pain prevention and management in hospitalised children. Both this first webinar and the second one, which you're about to hear today, will be available very soon on the, as a podcast on the CAFC website. So today's title is Reducing Pain in Infants and Young Children During Pokes and Other Procedures and the presenters are myself, Dr Christine Chambers and Janet Yamada and at this point I'd just like to thank Janet very much for stepping in at, at last notice replacing Dr Latimer who unfortunately had to withdraw at late notice so thank you Janet very much and we really look forward to your presentation. I would just like to make a disclaimer statement up front that all three presenters have no financial relationships to disclose or conflicts of interest. We are all supported by the CRHR team in children's pain, the Translating Research on Pain in Children, Tropic, and the Knowledge Synthesis Grants are also funded by CRHR. The objectives of this second webinar is to present evidence-based pain management strategies for pokes and other procedures for neonates, infants and toddlers, so our youngest population. To discuss pain assessment tools used and also importantly to describe the context in which evidence-based pain practices are implemented 
And as you'll hear as, along as we go, there's one thing to have very good, strong evidence about what we should do to reduce pain and another thing to really implement that evidence. And that depends largely on the context in which we practice. And you'll be hearing more about that from Janet Yamada, our third presenter today. So the background to pain in infants are that infants and toddlers are exposed to large numbers of painful procedures. And we know that during a scheduled childhood immunisation, up to 20 injections are given before two years of age. And these do cause a lot of pain and distress and fear in infants and toddlers. We also know that hospitalised infants are exposed to up to 10 procedures a day. There's been a lot of audits over the last 10 years or so, and they vary, but certainly between four to 10 procedures a day are what these sick infants undergo. We also know that there's ongoing surveys and audits of, that show minimal or no provision of pain management strategies during these procedures. However, there's good evidence to support use of pain reduction strategies. This is just a, a model of the promoting action on research implementation in health services, so the Paris framework. And this Paris framework is really what we frame our research within. And as I said before, we have the evidence. You can see up here in this pink circle but the implementation of the evidence is really an interplay between the context in which we work and how the evidence is facilitated in our work life. And again, you'll hear much more about this framework from Janet Yamada. So I'm going to talk about the evidence for pain management in infants. I'm going to talk mainly about breastfeeding kangaroo care, sucrose and other sweet solutions, and topical anaesthetics. So first of all, analgesics, analgesic effects of breastfeeding. How is breastfeeding analgesic? And it's really a combination of skin-to-skin -skin contact and the sucking and the pleasant taste, although not all that sweet, but certainly pleasant taste of breast milk, and probably also the intake of naturally occurring endorphins. Although breastfeeding is analgesic because it involves all these mechanisms, just purely giving small volumes of expressed breast milk or in fact other artificial feeds are less effective because these are not as sweet. So in a recent, or four years ago, systematic review of breastfeeding in neonates during heel ants and venipuncture reduced heart rate, reduced pain scores, reduced cry duration, were seen compared to placebo in all studies, compared to placebo, non-treatment, and just purely maternal holding. So just holding the infant is not nearly as effective as breastfeeding. The studies that include an arm of sucrose or glucose, they were generally equally or more effective. Importantly, there's been three trials during immunization in older infants, and I'm going to refer to this later study um, by Rezek and Al Dean because it includes 60 infants up to 8 to 12 months of age. And this is the oldest group of infants that have been studied in, uh, during breastfeeding. And this is during scheduled childhood immunisation, so well infants. This study showed reduced cry duration, reduced facial pain scores and reduced heart rate during the injection. And the authors uh, quoted that this pain reduction approach can be easily adopted as part of standard immunisation in injection programs. So that's a very interesting point that's certainly been debated amongst uh, many clinicians. And we will refer back to this study uh, shortly when we talk about actual implementation of this research. Of course, there's further questions that haven't really been addressed in the research. So is breastfeeding effective and feasible in sick infants? Is it, what, what are the practical challenges in really implementing it? And we certainly need to look at the overall organisational support for uh, clinicians and for parents to really implement breastfeeding during non-urgent painful procedures. We know we need low chairs or low stools required uh, for clinicians to actually perform heel lance and venipuncture. 
And there's some myths that come up whenever we talk about this. There's some beliefs that the infants will aspirate and that certainly has not been reported in any of the literature. And probably about 500 infants that I've had breastfeeding while I've done capillary heel lancers, certainly none have ever aspirated or coughed. They can come off and have a squeal and go back to the breast. There's a belief that breastfeeding could be associated with painful procedures which is a relatively easy one to bust given that painful procedures are performed uh, especially during uh, newborn uh, screening in well babies. They're only really done once or in, during injection a few times whereas breastfeeding occurs multiple times during the day and a belief that the procedures will take longer to perform. Then we move on to kangaroo care or skin to skin care. So skin to skin care is, is um, studied more frequently now. There's now seven studies of the analgesic effects and all studies show reduced pain scores and behavioural responses compared to placebo or no treatment. There's still conflicting results when compared to sweet solutions and conflicting results where the heart rate and oxygen saturations are also affected. Up to date there hasn't been a systematic review but uh, Johnson et al have now got a protocol in at Cochrane so if you go to the latest Cochrane protocols you'll see their skin to skin care for procedural pain and neonates protocol. So in the next couple of years we'll certainly see a comprehensive systematic review of all trials of skin to skin care. And again further questions concern the feasibility and practical challenges similar to breastfeeding. And really coordinating times of blood tests and other non-urgent procedures where feasible. And are we actually able to do this in our various organisations? And again, feasibility issues, feasibility, effectiveness and safety for preterm infants, sick infants and post-operative infants is something that we need to address. So now we have a poll, our first poll question. And this is a very broad question and I really want to know what you all think. Do you think in the next three to five years we can successfully implement breastfeeding or kangaroo care for all non-urgent procedures where feasible in infants both in hospital and outpatient settings? So we'll take a minute if you could um, address those poll questions and we'll have a short time for discussion. Okay, so... We have, it's quite a varied response. Unsure is a third, so it's about a third, a third and third. Um, yes, 40. So 40% 40 of you think that this is possible, 28% think it isn't possible and a third are unsure. So that's really interesting. So that that's actually, given the 40% and the 32% unsure, so two thirds of it, two thirds of you out there think maybe that this could be done and we don't know and again Janet will get on to this when we talk about the organisational, um, uh, the context in which we practice our evidence and certainly this is not a simple thing to implement. We, we really need buy-in from all our um, levels of from parents through to the clinicians and to our leaders. So thank you for uh, addressing that question. Now we move on to sucrose and as you probably all know out there it's the most extensively studied intervention to decrease procedural pain in infants. We've actually known that calming effects have been known for a very long time, way since uh, 569 AD Prophet Muhammad uh, declared give infants a well chewed date which in those days was the sweetest uh, substance possible. And throughout the years, and when I first started in the neonatal unit in Melbourne, we actually used Nilstat to stop the babies crying. And we, we never really knew why until we started looking at it in more depth. And it stopped babies crying because it had 12.5% sucrose. So we had actually been using this since 1981. So how does it work? There's thought to be two mechanisms. One is the strong sweet taste which really grabs the infant's attention but that's not enough. It's a, it's a further mechanism which is probably release of endogenous opioids. This is thought to be the mechanism although we can't actually uh, fully test that 
we've not been able to demonstrate that in uh, human babies. The peak affects it around two minutes and we know it's not effective if we give Narcan because Narcan competes for the same receptor sites. There's been a very recent systematic review which now includes 44 trials and nearly 3,500 infants. So it's 23 studies more than the 2004 review. So there's abundant evidence now of sucrose effectiveness for heel lance especially and venipuncture. There is conflicting evidence for more prolonged and distressing procedures which really shows us that although the peak effect is two minutes, we also know that the sweet effects only last five or so minutes. So these more prolonged procedures such as eye examination, urethral catheterization that go on and on, it really shows that that one single dose given two minutes before is insufficient and we probably need to um, give the sucrose in increments over uh, longer procedures. We have our second poll question here. How frequently do you or your unit organisation use sucrose or glucose for infants during heel lance? And I say heel lance because that is still the most frequently performed skin breaking painful procedure we do in our units. So if we go to the poll and we'll get your answers entered. So I can see that 35% use sucrose or glucose occasionally 29% often, 3% always, and 18% never. So certainly when we look at uh, the audits over the years, this is certainly getting up there. There's much more increased use of sweet solutions for procedural pain. And it's these 18% that never use it that we would really like to hear from and, and to see are these units consistently using breastfeeding or kangaroo care or topical anaesthetics, other effective uh, agents, or are these 18% still using nothing for their painful procedures in infants? So thank you very much. That's, that's um, pretty positive news for our babies out there. So what about older infants and children? Well, there are now 17 studies that have include infants from 1 to 12 months of age, and most of these are during immunisation. And there's also six studies that include infants or children more than a year of age. So I'll just go through these briefly. So during immunisation in infants 1 to 12 months, sucrose and glucose are effective, but effects seem to be more moderate than in the newborn, and mainly the effects are reducing crying after the procedure rather than the procedure itself. Two studies have included venipuncture and urethral catheterization, and these were conducted in a pediatric emergency department and neither of these studies showed that there was analgesic effects of the sweet solutions. And again, as I talked about it before, the dose was one single dose given two minutes before the commencement of the procedure and it was not effective. And once again, I really question if these solutions have been given in small volumes, still the total volume, but very small volumes given in increments over the procedure, would they have been more effective? Given these were sick babies and both venipuncture in sick babies and urethral catheterization certainly are not uh, short, quick, rapid procedures such as immunization and heel lance. And then during HILANCE, I conducted a longitudinal study really looking at sucrose use and effectiveness over a whole duration of hospitalisation in sick infants. And I noted that the pain scores, crying time, facial ex expression scores did not go up over the period of one to five months and they were, the pain scores remained low during the whole period. So certainly I felt that HILANCE uh, sucrose during heel lance certainly remained effective over a prolonged hospitalisation. So what about even older children, 1 to 16 years? Well there's varied effects and conflicting results and certainly in the children during cold pressure testing, during immunisation, during venipuncture, certainly sweet taste doesn't seem that effective. But what about the toddlers, this 18 month old immunisation that causes a lot of distress? So there's two studies and results are exactly opposite. So one study showed that sucrose worked and one study showed that it didn't. 
and both studies use the same solution. So we really um, do not know what works and what doesn't in this age group. And we actually think that there'll be quite a few more studies coming up in the next few years. So we have a systematic review in progress really to look at the ongoing uh, studies as they come through. So I guess all I can say here is watch this space over the next few years. So clinical implications. Sucrose or glucose can be recommended for use for infants up to 12 months of age. Only small volumes are required, but as I've said, effects are short lasting and most likely will be more effective if given in small increments, especially for those prolonged procedures. And for those multiple attempts or multiple immunizations, where there's three or four injections, give a small amount prior to each needle stick. There's various guidelines for use out there and I'm just going to show you the Royal Children's Hospital Melbourne guidelines purely because they're out there um, for every, anybody to access. And as you can see here, I'll go to the top. These are from the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne and there's some dose, um, dose guidelines here for nil orally babies for the preterms zero to one month and one to 18 months. And then there's also published guidelines and this is from Lafrac and Johnson et al. And I'll scroll to the top in a minute so you can see the reference. But if we look down here at the actual uh, administration guidelines, oral syringe application directly on the tongue if unable to suck. And again, some guidelines of volumes, 0.5 mil for infants, uh, preterm infants, up to a mil, two mils a day. And importantly, if we look at dose limits per day, there's no published limits of dosing. Use the small amount that provides pain relief. So these are um, a quite, I mean, I guess I can recommend these guidelines for uh, use. Oh, I've lost that, but I will go back to that. And I'll give you the reference at the end for that again. So what about overuse? I seem to have spent many years really um, promoting the use of sucrose when applicable for painful procedures. But I've heard over the years that maybe we overuse sucrose. And I guess we just need to stress that we this sucrose or glucose is very effective for management of short-lived acute procedural pain. We shouldn't promote the use for crying. We definitely should not promote the use for home because we can get into the situation when, whenever babies are crying that our families are giving sweet solutions and it's not appropriate and we, these babies at home certainly do not need it. We shouldn't promote the use of sweet solutions for ongoing distress, agitation, hunger, chronic pain and again only very small volumes are required. Ongoing questions still remain. Effectiveness and safety for ongoing use in extremely low birth weight infants and sick infants receiving morphine and other strong analgesics. And additional effectiveness with skin to skin contact and as I've already said, effectiveness in toddlers. So um, there's a online recipe for sucrose at, at the Sick Kids Hospital and this recipe is given out numerous times to anybody who asks. So I've actually given the recipe up here and that will also be on the pod podcast and the Sick Kids Pharmacy are more than happy to send this out to uh, any organisations. So we're moving now to topical anaesthetics such as Emla, Amatop, Angel Cream, Maxilene. There's quite a few on the market now. Now, these have been shown to be ineffective for heel lancing. Sucrose or glucose is generally more effective in the neonatal population and there's variable effects for venipunch and pick lines. But certainly these uh, agents are most effective for immunisation. And if we go to a recent systematic review and if we look at 270, oh, over 1,000 uh, infants and children were included in this systematic review of um, of all agents and all interventions during uh, childhood immunizations. And if we look at the infant data, 
the use of topical local anaesthetics was associated with less pain than placebo in four trials of infants. So certainly during immunisation, these agents are shown to be effective. But what are the clinical implications? Should we be recommending topical anaesthetics for all scheduled childhood immunisations? And I'd like to refer you to Neil Schechter's paper, which really looks at the consensus uh, statement for use of uh, topical anaesthetics uh, for immunisation. So our third poll question, how frequently do you use topical anaesthetics for infants and toddlers during procedures such as venipuncture, lumbar puncture and intramuscular injection? So I'll give you a couple of minutes to answer that. Not coming up yet, here we go. So 43% occasionally, 34% often, okay. Only 7% never and 7% always and 9% not applicable. So that's very interesting. So certainly topical anaesthetics are being used far more frequently now than they have been over the years. So again, that's a very positive news for uh, pain reduction in our young population. Now everything I've talked about is really more effective when given in a combination of strategies. So non-nutritive sucking of course we know is, um, is effective in conjunction with sweet solutions and obviously providing a supportive uh, parent friendly environment and swaddling also helps. So these are things that I haven't addressed on their own but they're certainly used uh, in combination with the other evidence-based strategies I've discussed. So that's one thing, the evidence. Do we actually use the evidence? And so I'm just going to present you data from the CIHR team in children's pain. This is data from project one. Uh, the team in children's pain is a three-phase uh, project. So project one was an audit of uh, pain management practices. So conclusions of our infant data, hospitalised infants were exposed to large numbers of painful procedures but yet despite the evidence, uh, breastfeeding, uh, sucrose or glucose, topical anaesthetics, skin to skin contact were actually rarely used in Canadian paediatric hospitals. And again this gets back to there's one thing about having evidence but there's an interplay between the the um, context and the culture in which we we practice evidence-based care. And then just briefly to finish off, I've talked about the evidence but how do we evaluate the evidence? And we know that assessment of pain is important to systematically evaluate effectiveness or otherwise of these interventions. And again this is something that Bonnie Stevens talked more about in webinar one and you will see the podcast for that. There are now over 40 pain assessment tools, so really in infants, so which one to use? And I guess I can refer to you to the most recent and best um, revision or synthesis of pain assessment tools, which is by Stevens et al in Pain and Neonates in the 2007 edition. But I've given here some examples. The neonatal facial coding system, which is nine facial expressions, these really form the basis for the majority of neonatal and infant pain scores. The NIP score is been uh, well used and well validated, especially for special care units in which babies aren't monitored as it's a behavioural pain assessment school. score. The uh, PIP has been very widely used, very well validated and, um, and used in the most research studies of pain management interventions. The pain assessment tool or the PAT was developed specifically for post-operative pain and is a very good post-operative pain assessment score. The NPASS is uh, an older score but yet only recently really um, validated so that's certainly an interesting score because you can use it for both pain and sedation. And the comfort scale we can recommend for use for ventilated infants. And these are just some examples, as I said there's many but the main thing is to consistently use a pain assessment tool that really fits your practice. 
So in conclusion, there's high levels of evidence to support various analgesic uh, benefits um, of interventions for pokes and other procedures. We've shown infrequent use during painful procedures, but um, your poll answers have certainly showed that this is on the change now. And it's important to consistently use validated pain assessment methods so we can actually ongoingly evaluate effectiveness of these interventions. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Christine Chambers. Okay, and while we're waiting, there, there are um, just a couple of questions that I can answer. Um, the evidence for sucrose during lumbar punches in full-term infants. Now, this is an interesting question because lumbar punches actually haven't been studied in any of the trials to date. Certainly, um, anecdotally, if lumbar punches are being done on relatively stable babies that we're doing lumbar punches purely for septic workup, it's very effective. For those few babies that we get in our intensive care units with meningitis, these babies are, are incredibly stressed and agitated, probably have a raging headache. We found that sucrose was not effective at all, which really highlights that it's a um, mild analgesic and certainly useful for uh, minor acute procedural pain. And it, we really could not get these babies that we're doing lumbar punches on uh, calm at all with sucrose. And so we really need to look at other options for pain management. So now we've got Christine ready. I, I will go through the rest of the uh, questions and we'll answer them at the end. So thank you for listening and over to Christine. Thanks, Denise. And thanks for doing such a, a comprehensive job of outlining uh, many issues that also apply to toddlers. So I'm uh, delighted to be here this afternoon to talk to you a bit about uh, pain and toddlers. And uh, for those of you who uh, work with toddlers or have toddlers of your own at home, uh, you can appreciate that this is a very sort of rapid period of growth and exploration. Um, it, this, by toddlers, I'm referring to children typically from 12 to 36 months of age, so from one to three years. And when you think about all of the motor, language, cognitive, emotional changes that happen in children from one to three, it really is quite remarkable. Uh, children go from walking just a, a few steps unassisted, maybe at around 12 months of age, to full out running and jumping by age three. They go from having just a few simple words to speaking in full sentences. And they across a number of important developmental milestones during this period, including toilet training, dealing with separation anxiety, becoming more aware of their surroundings and aware of peer reactions and adult reactions. So while it's a, a tremendously wonderful period to observe, as health professionals, pain assessment and management can be a challenge in this age group. Uh, and in fact, when we look at the amount of literature and knowledge that's been gained in pediatric pain over the last 20 to 30 years, the amount of attention that's been given to toddlers relative to younger infants and older children um, is, is relatively scant. And so today my job is to summarize some of the important issues around pain assessment and management that uh, relate to toddlers. So I wanted to start by uh, um, uh, asking a, a brief question in terms of a poll question around pain assessment. So I'd like you to reflect for a minute on the toddlers that you work with in your uh, clinical practice and uh, ask you which method do you most commonly use to assess pain in toddlers. So if you're working with a toddler and you're wondering how much pain they're in, are you relying on their self-report, so what the child says, observing their behavior, physiologic measures, uh, parent report, or some kind of combination of these methods. So we'll give everyone just a minute to respond. All right, so it looks like the vast majority of uh, individuals are using some combination of these methods uh, with another smaller proportion relying on observing behavior. Um, and not surprisingly, very few people relying on self-report uh, or even parent report at that age. So that's really interesting. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to now take you through some of the common methods that we use to assess pain in children generally and then speak about some of the caveats of using these methods with uh, young children and toddlers. 
So uh, as, you, as you're probably well aware, pain is really uh, a, a mystery to many. Uh, it's a subjective experience that causes a lot of distress, and there's no direct way of assessing pain 100%. And so often what we're in a position of doing is collecting information, as most of you are, from multiple sources. Um, a valuable source of information in uh, verbal children and older children and adults is self-report. It provides insight into that subjective experience. Uh, with children, we also use behavioral measures, and uh, Denise mentioned some of the measures that have been validated um, for use with uh, children and infants. Uh, physiological measures are used, uh, however, they've been found in, in older children, toddlers and older children to habituate with time, so usually aren't a very reliable um, or valid uh, measure of pain. And then, of course, observer reports. Uh, toddlers are usually accompanied by parents who know them very well and know when their child's behavior is, is different than normal. So this slide uh, depicts some of the common self-report measures. Actually, I think it's a little slow coming up on the screen there. Um, but uh, some of the different tools we use with older children who are verbal include a numeric rating scale, so having children rate pain from 0 to 5 to 0 to 10. Obviously, this is a challenging task for a young child. Uh, in our experience, children really can't use numbers in a way to express pain until they're over the age of 5. There are other measures that some young children are able to use, um, such as the poker chip tool, uh, which you'll see down here. It involves asking children to indicate how many pieces of hurt they have. Other scales that have been developed include combinations of numbers with pictures, uh, colored sliders, and also this scale, which many of you have seen, perhaps the Faces Pain Scale Revised. Now again, um, these measures are typically used with older children. Uh, toddlers typically cannot use these measures in the way that older children can. Occasionally, you'll have a three-year-old who is able to provide a more sort of detailed, quantified rating of their pain, but um, that would be the rare, the rare child. And usually what you'll be doing with self-report when toddlers is asking them if they have a hurt and most children are able to let you know yes or no. And in some cases, you might be able to get some gradation of the severity. But it's helpful to have these measures available and have them be part of your toolkit so that uh, you have things that you could take out and get a sense of whether the child understands them, have the parent comment on whether they think they could use them. But to date, none of these measures have been validated for use in children under the age of three. And when you think about it, uh, it's not as easy as it seems when you're asking children to report on their pain. These include, you know, this requires pretty sophisticated cognitive skills. It requires them to be able to classify and to be able to seriate, you know, put things in order. Um, they have to pay attention. They have to have enough memory um, for the procedure or the experience to comment on it. Uh, we've been particularly interested in their language um, comprehension and production and, you know, what words young children use and understand for pain. And they also have to have a pretty sophisticated understanding of emotions. They need to know what you're talking about when you're talking about pain and how that's different from just feeling nervous or feeling homesick if they're in the hospital. This is some data from a study we published a couple of years ago um, on pain language development in children. And you can see that uh, we basically surveyed um, children's parents, and we also used an online database to see what words children actually use in spontaneous speech for, play, or for pain. And what we found was that hurt was the word that was best understood by children um, and was on board at about 18 months of age, whereas other terms used for pain, um, ouch and ow, they were also on pretty early, 17, 18 months, but used less frequently. And uh, the word pain, interestingly enough, was used very infrequently by children in their spontaneous speech and wasn't well understood until about age six. So we have to be careful of the language that we use with toddlers. Are we using the words that they know and understand for pain? And again, parents can be a wonderful source of information. Uh, so in terms of self-report measures, no self-report measure has been validated for use with toddlers. Certainly there are a number of research groups out there trying to modify existing tools so that they can be more appropriate for use with some toddlers. 
but only about 25% of three-year-olds will be able to use a validated self-report measure. So sometimes it takes a little bit of creativity and speaking with the parents and your own clinical intuition to get a sense of how you can best get a self-report. So in the absence of uh, reliable and valid self-report from a toddler, uh, there are a variety of behavioral measures uh, to be used and that have been validated with toddlers. Uh, one of the measures that is um, most popular and has a lot of research evidence in support of it is the FLAC, uh, and those initials stand for the behaviors which are coded as part of the scale. And so that includes the face, legs, arms, cry, and consolability. And it's been validated for use with both procedural and post-operative pain. We also created a number of years ago the parents' post-operative pain measure, which is a 15-item behavior checklist that parents can fill out at home um, about their child's pain, and, and it will give you a score to indicate whether the pain is in the clinically significant range or not. And we have validated this with children all the way down to one year of age, so it has been validated for the toddler period. Again, what you should be paying attention to with these types of measures is the kinds of behaviors, uh, face, body movements, their crying, their consolability. And often these measures are asking raters to give a gradation of change. So is this a change in the child's normal behavior? There's also uh, a couple of other measures that I'll mention, the toddler preschool post-operative pain scale, as well as the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario pain scale. So while um, uh, self-report can be challenging with toddlers, there are validated behavioral measures that can be used. Again, um, working with the parents and uh, working with other health professionals to decide what are the best tools for this child, and then being sure to document that so that others can benefit from that information. In terms of uh, pain management, um, there are a number of strategies that Denise reviewed that are appropriate for toddlers as well as young infants, such as breastfeeding, or excuse me, uh, breastfeeding potentially, but also topical anesthetics. So I'm going to do a, a psychological pain management poll now in terms of psychological pain management strategies for toddlers. So which of the following um, do you believe works best with toddlers in terms of a psychological pain management strategy? Breathing exercises, hypnosis, distraction, or cognitive coping skills training? Wow, okay, well, we're getting a pretty clear response to these different polls. So we have 99% um, in support of distraction, 1% uh, uh, cognitive coping skills training. So that's wonderful, and we'll talk about some of these different psychological strategies now. Distraction certainly is very effective. It's usually easy to do, but there are some other strategies that we can use with toddlers as well. So this slide uh, provides just a, a depiction of what we mean by psychological strategies. Uh, they are a variety of non-pharmacological techniques um, that include age-appropriate uh, material. So for distraction, and I'll show you a slide in a minute about some age specific types of distraction. Um, but we also can engage young children um, and toddlers in even breathing exercises. That's um, taking deep breaths, using bubbles, uh, using um, any sort of, uh, you know, like a little windmill. What these types of breathing exercises do work well with some toddlers. Again, it depends on the particular cognitive um, ability of the child in terms of their development. But it's good to not dismiss these and uh, certainly they can be very helpful. Some of the other psychological strategies that are listed here uh, are generally used with older children. So things like hypnosis or imagery or more involved coping skills. These require a pretty sophisticated cognitive commitment on the part of the child, the ability to use their imagination, to follow a script. Um, and so some of these types of strategies, um, uh, depending on the specific child, could or might not be helpful for toddlers. Uh, modeling is very helpful to toddlers, so uh, giving them an opportunity to see another child, um, engaging in the same procedure successfully, giving toddlers a chance to rehearse what they're going to be doing, either on their own body or uh, using play uh, materials like a toy doctor's kit or a toy needle. Reinforcement is very powerful when children are doing things that you want them to, uh, to give them that positive feedback. And certainly involving parents. 
Research shows that parents want to be involved in their child's pain management, but yet often feel like they don't know what the right thing to do is. So a little bit of guidance around what they could be doing to be helpful goes a long way. In terms of distraction, again, many of you are using distraction in your own practice. Uh, again, it's important that it be age, uh, age appropriate. So for toddlers, things like bubbles, songs, pop-up books, party blowers, kaleidoscopes, toys. Uh, and it's very helpful if you can just have a kit in your office or a kit uh, in your clinic where you have some of these items where they're easily accessible. Um, you can also encourage parents to bring along some of the children's favorite things so that they can use their favorite pop-up book to be distracted. Um, some research shows that just a brief training procedure in distraction for health professionals can benefit many, many children. Um, and again, so distraction is it's easy um, and it's very effective. Bubbles is something that I use a lot with the children that I work with, um, particularly uh, the younger ones. They, all young children are engaged and interested in bubbles. And bubbles really meet two needs. They provide uh, distraction for the child, but they also encourage deep breathing. And so this is a very sort of concrete way to have a young child engage in deep breathing in a way that they can understand. So we have a variety of uh, strategies and psychological approaches to helping young children, but the parent is just as important as the child. And as I mentioned, many parents feel at a loss for what they could be doing to uh, best support their child. And there's been a lot of research on what parents do during medical procedures and how it is either helpful or not helpful. And so we've learned from this research that there are several things that parents do that can help. And by helping, I mean decreasing pain and decreasing distress. So engaging in non-procedural talk, essentially distraction, talking about things other than procedure, trying to focus the child's attention elsewhere. This has been shown to be helpful. Uh, using humor with the child. And again, it's going to be age appropriate. What entertains or a two-year-old is different from what entertains a 12-year-old. And giving the child suggestions on how to cope. So even very young children can be encouraged to look over at that poster on the wall or let's look at this book together. Interestingly, the research has also shown sort of a pattern of behaviors that can make things worse for children, and some of these are quite perplexing. Uh, criticism is not, um, and it's not surprising that ch parents who are criticizing their children um, might report experiencing more pain and more distress. Um, some of these other behaviors are a bit more surprising. Uh, reassurance in particular has been linked to increases in pain and distress in children. And uh, research in our group is trying to figure out why exactly. And it seems that reassurance might serve as a signal to children that their parents are anxious. And that signal might be causing children to feel more nervous themselves. Uh, together with a colleague, Dr. Anna Tadio in Toronto, we developed a worksheet for parents, so essentially a little tip sheet about how to, how to um, give pain-free injections. And it's meant for parents and for children. And it provides some tips for parents about how they can best support their child um, during painful procedures. And uh, this handout, as well as a lot of other wonderful material about pain, is available on the About Kids Health website from Sick Kids. Very important to note that psychological interventions can certainly be used on their own. So you can certainly use distraction by itself or as a supplement to pharmacological interventions, which we already know to be effective. So for example, uh, I encourage people to use psychological strategies like distraction with a child who has also had a topical anesthetic cream applied. These types of interventions are not mutually exclusive. And there's some evidence from combined research studies that show that combining intervention provides the maximal pain relief. So what is the evidence for the role of psychological strategies? Well, we've conducted a series of systematic reviews summarizing the research evidence. This is a review that was conducted by a PhD student working with me. And um, this review included children ages 2 to 19. So we did not include uh, one-year-olds, but there were some two-year-olds in the trials. 
And in this particular study, we found the most uh, research evidence in support of distraction, uh, combined um, psychological interventions, so interventions with more than one component, as well as hypnosis. But again, hypnosis was used with the older children. Recently, we conducted an additional psychological intervention review, and this was for immunization pain specifically. So the previous review was collapsed across all painful medical procedures. And in this particular re review, we included children uh, all the way down to infants. And again, we found the most evidence for distraction, combined interventions, and also the breathing. So the blowing out air, the blowing bubbles in young children was very effective. So my last poll question for you now is, what do you perceive as your biggest barrier to implementing psychological pain management strategies with your toddler patients? A, a lack of training in these techniques. B, a lack of time to implement the techniques. C, lack of support from your institution. Or D, other. All right, so we have um, the majority of participants, 39% saying a lack of time to implement the techniques, 33% uh, a lack of support from the institution, and 17% lack of training in these techniques. Well, it's very interesting. Um, we all have very busy clinical practices, and it can be really a challenge to try to integrate these techniques into our practice. Uh, and certainly institutions, sometimes when it comes to psychological strategies, they aren't seen as having the same kind of credit ability as a pharmacological intervention. Well, why is it important to make sure that we're using these strategies? We know that 90% of toddlers display behavioral distress during painful medical procedures. So it's a very common event and can take a lot of time on the part of staff to manage. We also know that children learn to associate health professionals with painful events at a very young age. Anecdotally, if you speak with family physicians or pediatricians, they notice a big change when 18-month-olds come in for their immunization, and it's all of a sudden the child that had been smiling at them at previous visits now seems very cautious. We also know that the development of needle phobias is a significant health problem. One in 10 individuals will go on to develop a significant needle phobia. And research on individuals with needle phobia shows us that they tend to avoid medical care, they do not donate blood, um, and they tend to um, be sicker because they're not as likely to seek medical care because of their fear. So we really believe in taking a preventative approach and being sure that children experience well-managed painful procedures early in life and that they benefit from both pharmacological, psychological, as well as a variety of other strategies. I know from looking at the demographics of those of you participating today that we had a large number of child life specialists uh, participating in the webinar. And I just thought I would highlight this research study we did a couple of years ago. Many of you might have responded to this. We had a large sample of child life specialists participate. Um, and they responded and indicated what pain management strategies they were using. And we were really impressed with uh, how much people were using these strategies, but also how much more willing they were to learn more. And so this webinar today is just one way to try to reach out and share some of this information. And one of the best predictors of uh, using pain management strategies, psychological pain management strategies, was perceived knowledge and skill. And so uh, trying to make sure that this information reaches the people who can use it in their practice. So in summary, uh, toddlers do experience considerable pain and distress during painful procedures. Pain assessment in toddlers can be a challenge, particularly with self-report measures, but we do have validated behavioral measures available. And there are a variety of psychological pain management strategies that can be used. I just wanted to direct you to a couple of resources as well. In addition to the About Kids Health website, which is wonderful, uh, Dr. Leora Kuttner has a book out um, that is it's a new edition that is now just available for order on uh, this website, the Crown House Publishing website. And uh, I have an advanced copy of it, and it provides tremendous detail for health professionals about how to implement uh, psychological pain management strategies in their practice. And there's also a love children's book um, that uh, can be used with children to help them, even young children, uh, work through their pain. So uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, I will turn it over to our next presenter. Great. Okay. Thanks, Doug.
Um, so I'm going to talk about the role of context in supporting the use of best evidence. And I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Margot Latimer for her contributions to this webinar. So there really is a disconnect or a gap between knowing the evidence and actually translating the evidence into practice. And as Denise Harrison mentioned in her presentation, only 5% of infants receive sucrose for procedural pain despite the substantial evidence that sucrose is effective. So I'm going to discuss how evidence, context, and facilitation are integrated in the knowledge translation process. And I'm going to highlight how the work context influences the use of evidence. So evidence alone to support, for example, the use of sucrose or kangaroo care for procedural pain is not sufficient to change practice. And we really need to look at the integration of evidence, context, and facilitation. So this is the Paris model or promoting action on research implementation in health services framework that Denise talked about earlier. And this was developed by Alison Kitson and Joy Wycroft Malone. And it examines the interplay between sources of evidence used to support practice changes, the context in which the practice change occurs, and methods used to facilitate the practice change. So in research, these constructs can be uh, related to process outcomes, such as pain assessment and management outcomes, as well as clinical outcomes, such as pain intensity. So the Paris framework proposes that successful use of evidence is the function of the interplay of evidence, context, and facilitation. And this integration is thought to account for the complexity of implementing practice changes. And each construct, evidence, context, and facilitation, is rated on a continuum from low to high, or from weak to strong. So in this framework, translation of research will be the most effective and efficacious when evidence, context, and facilitation are high. So that's where evidence is scientifically robust and matches professional consensus and patient needs, where the context is receptive to change with strong leadership and appropriate monitoring and feedback systems, and there's appropriate facilitation um, of change with input from both skilled external and internal facilitators. So when we look at the construct of evidence, Evidence not only includes just research evidence, but also includes clinical expertise, local data or information, and patient experience. And research evidence that's rigorous and relevant and valued, such as the systematic reviews that Denise and Christine mentioned, um, will be supported and will be highly rated on this continuum. Uh, clinical expertise is also considered high when experience is reflected on, tested, valued, and relevant. And as Christine mentioned, patient and parent experiences rates highly when patients can engage in health professionals and can collaborate in the change process. And finally, local evidence from audit and performance data is highly rated when the data are valued, rigorously evaluated, and interpreted. And this information can be used to guide practice changes. So facilitation refers to the enabling or making implementation of evidence into practice easier. And research evidence should really be tailored to the needs of health professionals and should be delivered by facilitators in a way that's acceptable to them, um, rather than just performing the tasks for them. So there are knowledge translation strategies that have been proven to be effective, such as reminders and educational strategies. And these can be used to promote the practice changes. So context, context refers to the environment or setting in which an evidence-based practice occurs. And the context can be made up of three sub-elements, uh, unit culture, leadership, and evaluation system. So I'm really gonna concentrate on these three sub-elements of culture, leadership, and evaluation within context. So how does the work context influence the use of evidence? So I'm going to have a poll question, and in my work context, meaning your work context, um, there are regular formal opportunities to learn about and discuss patient care with colleagues. So just take a minute to answer this. Okay, so 
We have 8% never uh, have formal opportunities, but we have occasionally 39% have opportunities to uh, engage in opportunities to learn. Um, often 29% and looks like, sorry, 32% and 14% always. So these are opportunities um, such as conferences, workshops, in-service and seminars. So there is a variety of um, answers that we have for this question. Okay, so back to the sub-elements. Um, culture refers to a way of thinking about or viewing an organization, and culture is considered to be high or strong in the continuum when there's a high regard for individuals, when there's a supportive learning environment, when there's available resources and supportive individuals, and most importantly, when the change initiative is in line with the organization's strategic plans or goals. So having a pain assessment as part of the hospital strategic plan is an example, or having buy-in for the uh, use of kangaroo care to reduce procedural pain in infants is another example. Effective leadership involves the use of transformational leaders who assume a decentralized roles, and these individuals enable and empower individuals to share a common vision through development of clear roles, to promote effective teamwork, and to support collaborative decision making. Finally, evaluation and feedback using methods such as performance audits help health professionals to be more receptive to implementing pain practice changes. So an audit of a unit's pain practices can be fed back to health professionals, and this information can be used to guide and tailor strategies to promote a pain practice change. And Denise mentioned the pain audit that she conducted on infants from the CIH or Team in Children's Pain. And this, this type of data can be fed back to health professionals in the NICU as a baseline practice uh, information, and they can use this information to change their practice. So what does a supportive organizational context look like? So if we bring the, the Paris framework back into play, value-oriented learning culture receptive to change, a transformational leadership that supports teamwork and staff involvement in decision making, and evaluation of various levels of performance with effective feedback mechanisms. So my second poll question is, how would you rate your organizational context? So we'll take a minute to answer this question. Okay, so the results are that 59% um, felt that they had um, supportive context, organizational context. Um, there was a variety here, 8% 8, 8 rated poor, 18% low, and 7% high. So I just wanted to uh, talk about context, and evidence is, is only one aspect to consider in the management of pain in hospitalized infants and children, but actually the impact of both context and facilitation is an important factor that influences translation and use of research um, evidence into practice. So we have a disclaimer that variations exist between institutions and the use of pain management strategies. And uh, to find out more about individual policies, to please refer to your institutional guidelines. Uh, and just a reminder that the final webinar of the 2010 series, Pain Matters in Children and Adolescents, will be presented on Tuesday, September 22nd, from 12 to 1.30 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, the podcast for our first webinar from post to post-op, an overview of pain prevention and management in hospitalized children, which was presented by Dr. Bonnie Stevens and Dr. Fiona Campbell, uh, will be available for download soon. So just please continue to check the CAPC website. Right, thank you, Janet. Um, you, you did say that uh, the, uh, the next webinar would be the 22nd. Your slides are the 21st, and it is it is the 21st that it will be uh, Tuesday, September 21st at 12 o'clock Eastern time. Okay, great. Okay, so I, I'm just uh, we just have our acknowledgments for um, the three of our speakers here, as well as we'd like to thank the contribution of the funding agencies as well as the participating uh, centers. So we do have some time to answer questions, and I think what I'll do is. I'll bring Dr. Denise Harrison back online to answer some of the infant-related questions and Dr. Christine Chambers to talk about the questions related to her speak, speech as well. Hold on. Well, 
Well, this is Christine Chambers. I have a couple of questions here that have been uh, posted that I'd be happy to answer. Um, one of the questions relates to uh, the role of child life. Um, I had a comment about how uh, child life specialists can be particularly invaluable in ensuring that uh, non uh, pharmacological or psychological pain management strategies are delivered. And certainly that's very much the case, and that's uh, what we found in our survey of child life specialists. We were actually pleasantly surprised to see how engaged they were in delivering these types of strategies uh, to children and their families. I also have had a question about how many hospitals have child life um, uh, uh, specialists available to assist children. And that's a question I actually don't know the answer to. I know that most of the uh, major health centers or pediatric health centers do have child life departments, um, but I'm not sure of the specific number. Um, and a couple of other points that were raised, an interesting question around uh, the words that children use for pain and whether there have been any studies from a cultural perspective. Um, and uh, no, not that I'm aware of. Uh, there's no other published studies. I Anecdotally, we've had children with different cultural backgrounds participate in some of our research, and we've also visited other countries. And there does appear to be a very sort of unique um, pain language or vocabulary that is culture specific. So uh, hopefully we will have some more research uh, in that area. I don't know, Denise, if you're there, if you have any of your questions that you'd like to answer. Yes, thank you, Christine. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> so we've got a couple of questions here and some we can combine because they, they relate really to that grey area of uh, chronic pain and those ongoing procedures such as um, you know, stretching for the, the club feet and plastering. Like I said, sweet solutions are effective for acute, minor, painful procedures of relatively short duration. So certainly for those babies with more chronic pain or multiple procedures, if there's an acute procedure such as the actual plastering or the, the physio uh, for these babies with club feet or the actual bathing for those very sick babies with EB, certainly sucrose can be used uh, to really complement other pain management strategies. But to give it chronically for babies in chronic pain over days to weeks to months, certainly we don't know anything about that and we really don't recommend it, as I said, because it only works for five to eight minutes. So if we do have a baby that's chronically crying or hungry or really uh, sick and ha has many other procedures or many other uh, comorbidities happening at the same time, it certainly isn't the answer and we really need to manage those babies much more effectively with uh, systemic analgesics. Uh, I've also got a, a question um, how, um, how to give, sorry, is it safe to give sucrose for infants being tested for blood glucose serial, serially? So for those babies especially, the infants are diabetic mothers who have very fragile uh, blood glucose Certainly in the studies that have looked at blood glucose levels in the infants that have had placebo compared to glucose, there's absolutely no differences. And remember, we're using very small volumes. And the best studies to refer to is a Celeste Johnson's study where she looked at sucrose uh, for all painful procedures over one week of life in preterm infants. And Dr. Bonnie Stevens' study, which again looked at sucrose for all painful procedures, but for a whole month of life. And in these studies, there were no differences in blood glucose levels between the placebo groups and the sucrose groups. So we can certainly uh, say that there does not seem to be any, the sucrose or glucose we give does not raise the blood glucose level. But again, remember, we're giving it in very small volumes. Uh, there's also a question about topical anaesthetics and this is something that Dr Fiona Campbell covered in much more detail in the first webinar but the question was about vasoconstriction and I guess the best paper I can refer to you is uh, John Brown et al. Topical amethacane or amatop is superior to MLA for IV cannulation in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia in 1999. The, this paper showed that MLA certainly resulted in far more vasoconstriction than did uh, amatop. So it's the prolocaine component. 
Uh, but again, uh, Fiona Campbell is much more an expert, and we would refer to you um, refer you to both that podcast and this paper. So there are a couple more questions, but Christine, are you ready to answer any more of yours at yes, the minute? Yes, I, I, I do have a few other ones here. Um, one uh, person made a very important point about how often uh, procedures, particularly with toddlers, are not thought ahead, and so they're just needed to be done now, and that there isn't always time for, for preparation and for appropriate pain management. And indeed, this is a challenge, and um, certainly when children are in home, hospital, it's helpful to provide instruction in these strategies prior to when they need a procedure, or even if you don't know that they will, to figure out what works well for them distraction for distraction and have that available. Having tools accessible, I think, ends up being a big determinant of whether these strategies are used. If you have things in the room and you're able to access them quickly versus something that needs to be organized. And certainly I'm a big proponent of advocating and educating parents about proper pain management because parents are in the best position to make sure that their children um, have the things that make them comfortable and that the parent and you as a health professional can also ask, does this need to be run, done right now or can we have five minutes to get the child distracted or get some bubbles? Um, so it's a challenge, but sometimes you know you can figure out a way to work around it. Another really good question about what what exactly is hypnosis? And certainly the term hypnosis, I think, has a bad reputation. Sometimes people have images of ravine or something very mystical. Um, and in the psychological literature, hypnosis really is just a two-step strategy. It involves providing relaxation. Um, and also suggestion. Uh, and the suggestion might take the form of guided imagery. Uh, and again, hypnosis, I have only probably been able to use this strategy with the maybe a handful of three-year-olds. But using imagination, asking kids to imagine that they're on in their favorite place or taking a special trip or that they're one of their favorite superheroes, um, these types of strategies can be really helpful um, with young kids. Um, another question I had was about, do we use uh, positions of comfort? Um, and uh, certainly um, there's a lot of interest in positioning. And in the systematic reviews that we've done for immunization, uh, we today you've seen the uh, cover sheet for both the psychological and the pharmacological reviews. We also had a review on uh, physical strategies. And uh, the data that exists shows that being held by a parent or for older children sitting versus lying down does significantly reduce pain. Um, but I'm unaware of any other systematic review on uh, the positions of comfort per se. Denise, do you have any more questions? Thank you, Christine. I actually do, so I'm going to address some of them. First of all, what about the uh, use of positioning for comfort in infants during medical procedures? Certainly the studies that have looked at positioning compared to sweet solutions, sweet solutions are far more effective and prone positioning uh, is not nearly as effective as a sweet solution. So positioning on its own really isn't effective enough. I've got some a very interesting uh, question about um, non-nursing staff administering sucrose. And that's one thing uh, back at my work in Melbourne, we initially had sucrose as nurse initiated. We've since um, made it technician initiated. So our phlebotomist, our medical imaging people uh, can now give and sign for sucrose. And I'd like to acknowledge Kate Austin for doing most of this work at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. This is something, uh, getting back to really Janet's talk about organisational uh, structure and buy-in, this is something as a hospital we talked about with with all our um, involved people and we actually got it through and it's, it's, it's great. It just means that sucrose can be given in situations outside of when nursing and medical staff aren't there. And uh, so certainly uh, either myself or I know Kate would be happy to um, give you further advice on that. And you'll have our emails up on the podcast. 
some more questions also, contraindications of using sucrose. So one is that children who have ileostomies, it really gets back gastrointestinal effects. And I guess I just have to say for our children who uh, kneel orally or have um, compromised guts, very small amounts of sucrose that we do administer haven't been shown to cause any problems. Again, though, I wouldn't like to get into the situation where we're using large amounts of sucrose um, for these babies because it, it is uh, quite hyperosmolar. But we've had no problem. And again, if we use it in the small doses, there's uh, really not an issue. There's a question also about if breastfeeding and sucrose are not available, what about uh, feeding formula milk? As I said before, the actual uh, sweet taste analgesia is uh, sweet taste dependent. So just small amounts of food or breast milk given in isolation are no more effective than water. But that doesn't um, mean to say that giving a whole feed or at least, say, 5 to 10 mils or large, larger volumes of feed would not help. And in fact, they probably would because it involves more than just uh, the sweet taste. Now, there are a few more questions, um, and I will answer all of these or address all of these uh, for the podcast. I just noticed that Christine has some more questions, and we've only got five minutes left. So I'm going to hand it back to Christine, if that's okay with you. But don't worry if I haven't addressed your questions. I certainly will uh, address them and give references um, to the best supporting evidence uh, in the podcast, which you'll see in a couple of weeks. Oh, thanks, okay, Steve. so back over to you, Christine. <laughs> Thank you. Likewise, I, if I can't get through all of the questions, um, I will certainly do so after the webinar ends. I had an interesting comment um, that's just been sent in. So that some nurses think it's better to sensitize uh, children to pain, so not using mild pharmacological or non-pharmacological pain management for routine immunizations. What are your thoughts on this? Um, the, the person writes, I think some think if we minimize the pain too much, children will experience higher perceived pain if they don't have experience with pain. Um, and so I think this really gets at sort of a core myth um, that many health professionals and, and parents hold that somehow experiencing pain builds character and that, um, you know, by experiencing pain, children learn how to cope with pain. But all of the research shows that that is not the case, that uh, children experiencing poorly managed uh, procedural pain actually increases the pain at subsequent procedures. And uh, increasingly, research is showing us that children develop what we would call like a sensory memory for pain. And so that, um, the, you know, their bodies remember it. And it does not habituate. In fact, it seems to make subsequent painful experiences even more painful. So I always tell families that children learn how to cope with pain by being taught how to cope with pain and by be, being given proper pain management interventions. Um, in terms of the other part of that question was, do you have any resources or books for guided imagery? The best resource um, that I recommend to health professionals is uh, Leora Kuttner's work. It's fabulous, and uh, she uh, this new edition of the book really is very helpful. So uh, that would be the resource that I would recommend. Um, I think I have another one here, which was, is there any research supporting the use of non-pharmacological pain assessment and management techniques with uh, developmentally delayed infants and toddlers? Um, and unfortunately, um, there, are, there are a couple of very preliminary trials showing that children with developmental disabilities do seem, uh, some of them, to be able to learn these strategies, but we don't have any uh, trials, per se, with uh, younger kids. And I know that some of this work is ongoing. Dr. Lynn Bro here at Dalhousie is uh, conducting a, a trial with of cognitive behavioral interventions with um, uh, children with uh, developmental delay. So hopefully that data will um, be growing. But anecdotally, certainly, depending on the cognitive ability of the child, um, you certainly can teach them strategies. You may need to be a little more creative um, and find things that engage them and interest them, but there's almost always something that you can come up with and use. Um, 
And I think I've got a few other questions, but I think as we're drawing to a close, I will uh, answer those in other ways. Okay, great. Thank you, Christine. Because we haven't really um, addressed any questions about pain management, I just want to address one more question, which is a great question for both of us, Christine. How often should staff reassess pain in children to ensure pain management is consistently effective? And the whole issue of pain assessment is really uh, to ensure that our pain assessment is tied in with our pain management. So it's not just something we document as per policy, as per um, routine observations, like pain is the fifth vital sign, but it's something we talk about and we actually use our pain scores uh, in our ward rounds and in our pain management. So the question how often, it's really if pain is the fifth vital sign, well it's assessed hourly during the first few post-operative hours and four hourly and up to twice a day or whatever the vital observations are. But it is a great question and it's one that many of uh, the pain researchers in, in the world are still grappling with because we have all these tools but yet we're still really not implementing pain management, a uh, pain assessment, sorry, into our normalised uh, practice. So it is a great question and I think it's a great one to really end this webinar. And so I just would like to uh, reiterate that we will be posting answers to all our questions up on the uh, podcast. Yeah, I, I wanted to just thank everybody who has participated. We were overwhelmed with how many people were going to be part of this webinar today. And I think you all are showing interest in pain and have the power to go back to your, your clinical units and the patients that you work with and, and uh, hopefully um, promote some change. Thank you, Dr. Harrison, Dr. Chambers, and Janet Yamada. That was a great presentation. We had a lot of questions. I think it was a lot of great information, a lot of really good tools, I think, that people are going to take back to their patients. Uh, also, would like to thank the Canadian Institute for Health Research for providing funding not only to the team in children's pain, but also for this podcast series. If you are interested in learning more about pain in children and youth, or if you are looking to find some of the resources and references that have been mentioned in this podcast, go to the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network at www.can.cafc.org. That's www.ken.cafc.org, and check out the category on children's pain. If you're interested in viewing other podcasts in this series on children's pain, go to the CAFC website at cafc.org slash podcasts or search on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. Thank you again to everyone, to all the presenters, to the Canadian Institute for Health Research and the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. Uh, and thank you to everyone for attending this podcast. We hope you learned something and we hope you enjoy the other webinars in this series. Thank you.